Um, I'm going to start with First Man. So how soon after La La Land did you come on board First Man? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think it was like a year later, mm -hmm. uh, but it was well before. I knew about it uh, before I started official prep. So I probably mm -hmm. knew about it about six months before I started officially, maybe eight months because I knew I was going to do two movies at the back to back, so I started my research uh, in the fall, and I didn't start prep officially on that film until the summer, like a little bit in the summer, and then at the end of the summer, it started full, full on. Mm -hmm. So, reteaming with Damien Chazelle, uh, what was that like, and what kind of discussions did you have going into it? It was great. It was very much like La La Land. It just was a different subject matter, but his approach is very much the same. Um, he knows exactly what the film is going to look like and has the intention behind what he wants the scenes to sort of effect as, as you know, as, as we go by, scene by scene, he knows what the intention is behind it. And it was very much the same. Like he's, it's just a different subject matter. His intensity is, is the same, but he's a incredibly, um, he's very much a collaborator and, is very open to ideas and to meetings and discussions and show and tells and he'll be there whenever you need him to be there and uh, so that was all the same it what didn't change even though like he became mega famous after La La Land he was very much the same man and uh, really hardworking and really inspiring and so it's infectious like you want to you want to be that way too and I mean, I'm kind of normally like that, but it, like he's a, he's very inspiring mm -hmm. to be around, and so it was very much the same. This time we he did uh, he did sort of in the beginning of La La Land, we did this meeting where we went through the script page by page and um, took notes, and it was me and production designer and set design and locations. And this time he did it digitally, and mm -hmm. that was the diff that was a big difference because he could share it with everybody, and he didn't have to say it over and over and over again and he could make additions and it was this ma I still have it it's uh this it was kind of like the bible for the film and I would constantly refer back to it and uh but he would reference like the script and then he would per sometimes he would um add uh, a film that was inspiring to him or a scene from a film that might have inspired that particular scene or a photograph or a painting or um, notes from meetings he had had with all of us. And so he, he, we started early on with the discussions about how he wanted it to look. And um, we knew early on he wanted it to have a documentary feel to it. And uh, so it was a lot alike mm -hmm. to answer your question, a very long-winded <laughs> way to answer your question. Uh, well, the, the look of it is completely different from La La Land, which was very bold and bright, a lot of jewel tones. Yes. First Man is very muted and restrained, fits with the story and Neil Armstrong. So... How did you approach uh, the aesthetic for First Man in that sense? Uh, we we appro I approached it by uh, my pitch to Damien was to use to use a lot of natural fibers, cottons and wools, and to be able to sort of pull back some of the color um, and sort so it would have the effect of a Kodachrome photograph. That's how we wanted it to look. And I knew we were going to shoot on 16 millimeter. Some of it's 16, some of it's 35, and some of it's IMAX. That was made, that's enough to make you a little, like you don't know kind of what it's going to look like. That was a little intense and um, intimidating. But in the end, it really makes the movie make a lot of sense story-wise to me. Um, the IMAX is used when he steps out onto the moon and all the pieces at home and a lot of the flashbacks are 16 millimeter. And then sometimes when he needed a depth of focus, like in um, Mission Control, it was 35. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, no, we just, we, nothing went to camera without being aged first. And uh, that's sort of how we approached it. And I knew we were going to have a lot of close-ups and so I wanted to be able to have the texture come alive and to me you can do that with a f fabrics that you can actually see the the weave the warp and the weft and so that's what I focused on when I was pulling and when I was fitting the actors and when if when we built quite a lot uh, on the film and so whenever we built something I was trying to use that type of fabric to to make sure the texture sort of came alive because he Cause you like yeah because Ryan because <laughs> there's a lot of like guys in white shirts 
but no, they're, they're not. But like in, in the work I scenes, begged but, to differ. Ryan, but Ryan wears a lot of plaid too. And no, but I tried of, very hard not yeah. to use white shirts in Mission mm-hmm. Control. You, if you watch the movie again, I really, really didn't use them. But they are. It's period correct, but they're um, there might be something with an end on end print. There yeah. might be something with a fine stripe. There might be something. Um, there might be pale yellows. There's pale blues. There's um, there's actually a lot of texture in that room because I didn't want it to be like a room of white yeah. because we didn't want the it wanted a grittier feel it didn't want to feel antiseptic at all it feels very lived in and so there's um, it's the opposite there's there's one guy in a white shirt uh, <laughs> at, and and he because he really wore one like it was written in some note that I found and I mean we tried to be really true to characters and a lot of a lot of the movie is filled with people trying to or people. Um, acting as real people in history. And the film is, all the cast are playing real people, and even the background were assigned to be playing real people that were actually at Mission Control during Gemini 8. Gemini, it's not Gemini, it's Gemini, which I didn't know until I started working on the film. But anyway, um, so it's not a lot of, I tried really hard not to, I'm, I feel bad that you think there was all no, white I don't, shirts. No, I don't think there's, no, there's just like multiple guys in white shirts, but I, but I like that when you did the opposite with um, like Claire and Ryan's costumes, because there was a lot of color in her dresses and like yeah. the plaid he wore, yeah. which was a nice contrast when you did see the white, like at, in like Mission Control, because... No, there there was a lot of color. It's just <laughs> muted. <laughs> I'm because when when the yes. white comes on we screen, used, it's very stark. We used a lot of we did use color at home because it's meant to be like home was a place that story wise it was all in a, an effort to tell the story and yeah. story wise home was a place where and especially in the beginning of the film where there's hope and there's safety and the point of the movie is how dangerous these missions were like and people who think, oh, we went to the moon. They have no idea the sacrifices that were made and the people who died. And like, they're up in these, and I saw them. They're like rickety little, like you can flick them and they're, they don't feel like they should be launched into the moon. And so launched to the moon. And so these missions that they were going on, so that was very dangerous. And so the home was meant to be a place of like a haven of safety and comfort. And so, yeah, we used color and, um, and it kind of worked on on Neil, and Neil Armstrong really did wear quite a lot of plaid, and mm-hmm. um, he wears bandlon too towards the end. And we did sort of an arc of palette, sort of removing the color out of Neil's life as he, because he kind of got so intense about the project that he did lose those around him, and he lost sight of those around him, and in doing, and in that same way, he lost sort of the color in his life. So. <laughs> Um, and then Claire, we ended up building quite a lot of clothes for Claire because it was just, um, I couldn't find exactly what I wanted. And, um, but we did definitely get inspired by the real people and by what Janet Armstrong really wore and the kind of style that she had. She had a really pretty simple classic style and, uh, but, and she always, she, she looked great. And so we tried to do the same thing with Claire. And so you can't find exactly what you're looking for. And so we ended up making quite a bit of her stuff too mm-hmm. which was it's always fun to to build when you can and you built the nasa suits yes right? how was that horrible <laughs> um <laughs> it was really hard yeah it was really hard uh, but we did it and it was just a painstaking process and because th- that was about finding something that was historically existed and trying to recreate it and trying to be as authentic as possible down to the zipper and the knobs and the gloves and the helmet and blowing the visors and the reflective you know we we did sort of go for it we didn't try to make it anti-reflective we made it what it really was but it was um it's very nerve-wracking and um we had actors of all different sizes so the patterns all had to shift every you know where it was just very costly they're (laughs) a lot of money they are they're really expensive they look huge, and I mean, it was it looked very accurate. So yes, yeah. yes, we tried to be accurate. We had that. We did have NASA's full cooperation, and they let us look at the real suits and um, look, not touch, and uh, and measure accordingly. And then we um, we also had uh, were able to see the X fifteen suit, a real one, in a collector's um, a collector in California had one and we got to see it in person and he let us touch it and that was pretty exciting. No, it's, it's, they were very cool suits. They're really, um, totally utilitarian. 
they weren't trying to make them look cool. Like from our eyes, they kind of look cool. But for NASA, they were trying to make it like they had – because some of them were going outside of the space – Craft. So they were walking spacesuits, in effect. And Apollo 11 was made by the Playtex company who made girdles. <laughs> Fun fact. A really cool fact. Um, well, switching to Buster Scruggs, uh, yes. you've worked with the Cohen since Fargo. Correct. Right? Yeah. So what's your process like with them? I, they have, they, we, we got the script. They didn't have a green light and they didn't have the final story. The, the Buster Scruggs is a series of six Westerns. Uh, so I, we read this, I read the scripts and I thought they're pretty dark. And I thought to myself, this is never going to get a green light, but it did. And it was greenlit by Annapurna, who then three weeks before we s were shooting ended up, it ended up being a cross breed with Annapurna and Netflix. But, um, that process. So once we got the green light, I started doing research and I have done a few Westerns before. And so I had, you know, it was kind of in my memory, but I had to refresh my memory. And, but there was also the, the stories are each completely different and they all have sort of a different like point of inspiration. And so we watched some of the films and read some of the stories that were, uh, they were inspired by to write these pieces. And they wrote them over a course of 25 years, I think. And, uh, so it was a re research discussions. They were in LA um, it's very much the same every time I work with them. We do first do like visual research meeting where I pull a bunch of research and kind of show them, am I kind of in the right direction? And they're like, yes or no. And then we have a second meeting. And at the second meeting, I put my boards together and done sketches if I feel like I, you know, sometimes if you can't find the right research, you do the sketch or you just sketch because you're inspired. But um, so then I had that meeting and then we just, they start, you start pulling. You know, that's the way it happens and then you fit. And this one was kind of strange because there were like weird things that we had to attend to that like an, there's a performer in one of the stories that's meant to not have any arms and legs. And so that was something I did. I thought it was going to be CGI, but it was actually left to the costume department to try to figure okay. it out. And um, that was really stressful. Like, uh, you know. So I, how did you do it? Well, one thing was... Um, and it was also with the help of the art department and then visual effects. Like they helped because they did car, but we built shirts with four arms so that when he was shot in the front, he could put his arms through the back arms and then the front oh, arms. And, and then we it, dropped yeah. the shoulder a little bit to cheat. And, but the forearm idea was, that was probably the best idea I had all year. <laughs> and, um, then. <laughs> well, in that same episode, um, it's Liam Neeson and his yes. giant bear The giant skin. bear coat, yeah. So how did you make that? That, uh, well, it was scripted that he had a big bear coat on, I'm pretty sure. And Ethan was like laughing, saying, oh, you know, like McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which is a, it's different than the, the tone of the story. The story is pretty dark and they're just, I also got the note, like, it's just dismal. And it's freezing. So there's not a ton of photographs from this time period. And most of the photographs are not very accurate, in my opinion, because they've taken them in a, in a studio. And sometimes they've used the clothes from the studio. And so you can't really go by photographs completely. Like for richer people, I think it's appropriate. But for people who are – anyway, not that not everybody took photographs. And nobody took photographs of themselves in the cold. So you, I relied a lot on written like diaries and texts and books. And that's my favorite type of research for this time period anyway. And in reading that, uh, in doing my research, I came across like a description of a, of a shabby, and it was made from Shirling. And so I found a really great reproduction of a, in a photograph from a museum and I showed that to them. And so they liked that idea. Then it was a matter of trying to get it done and uh, that was a design. That was really hard. We ended up, we couldn't find shearling like to dye the same color. And anyway, it's a long story. We ended up using rugs from Ikea. Just like Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Ikea should start selling just for coats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know about the Game of Thrones until yeah, after. Yeah, they did like Jon Snow's capes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we carved our, we dyed them first, but that's the only thing we could get that would dye consistently the same color. And then they had to, if you look inside the coat, there's like 30 
pelts and they're all sewn together by hand and it looks really great. It kind of looks like he did it himself. And uh, and then, but we clipped it and shaved it. And I didn't do this. My amazing ager or distressing artist, Rob Phillips, did most of it. And he clipped into it and airbrushed it with paint. And then the fi- and then he would shave into the worn areas. And the final um, coup de gras was hair products. Like hairspray, gel? Like- yeah, like gel just to get it gunky and gross. And and but then Joel and Ethan would visit quite a lot and we had we had some fittings with them in New Mexico, some fittings, a lot of them were done in LA and um I would take photos and the the pan guy, there's that one scene where the pan that was a video because he comes charging at the camera and they wanted to hear how the pans mm-hmm. were gonna and see how they move. But if you haven't seen it, it's kinda hard to describe. But anyway. Um He's attacking James Franco. He today. comes at J- James Franco tries to s- rob his bank, and he comes barreling out in a unitar or a, u- a union suit with like a pan, like a bunch of pans over him. It's pretty funny. Anyway, <laughs> um, but the the film was filled with challenges like that, and made it really interesting to design. Like I love designing that film, and uh, that was a, one. Do of you have them. a favorite? Hmm? Of do you have a favorite outfit from any of the six? Or because I also like Buster Scruggs, like all white. Yeah, that was a outfit. fun outfit. Yeah. No, I like. I I might have a. But even in that, I love what Willie Watson wears. The guy in black at the end. Mm-hmm. Sh- I don't want to give it away. But anyway, um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I like Tyne Daly has one of my favorite. Oh, costumes. that was gorgeous. Yeah, yeah the last one it was really fun. I got to do a bustle dress. That was yeah. fun. Um, well, so what are you working on next? Uh, trying to find a job <laughs> of something that I want to do. I find like this, it's interesting, like tonight there's all, like there's four costume designers who are very talented and there's more talented costume designers than there are good projects. projects. Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, something will come up. Definitely. All right. Well, Mary, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you up here in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you.